Duo's Carnival of Souls. The letter. No. No. Definitely not. Oh, you're cute. Professional groupie. No. <sighs> Alyssa tossed her phone onto the dresser and flipped onto her back, staring at the ceiling. What was wrong with her? She worked out, was good at drawing, and had a wonderful sense of fashion. Boys should practically be jumping for her, but she only seemed to attract the attention of the less desirable ones. And it wasn't that she didn't like it, but a woman has to have her standards. She blew the aub on her hair, covering her face away. A voice called out for her, signaling it was time for dinner. She let a large sigh and sluggishly pulled herself out of bed. Glancing over at the vanity, she saw two green eyes staring back at her. She gave an ingenuine smile to herself before her lips sagged again. Twenty-six and still living with mom. Maybe that's where it all went wrong. A table was set with a holiday ham and many fixings that most are accustomed to at the most wonderful time of the year. Christmas was right around the corner, after all. Five places were neatly set at the table. Her father had already been sitting at its head, newspaper spread wide. Alyssa, it's good to see you. You're not wasting away in that room. Funny how you live here and I rarely get to see you. He cast a half-hearted smile at her. Well, you do work all day. Every day, it seems. Honestly, I'm surprised you even came home today. As she said this, she realized it had been a mistake. You're goddamn right I work all day. To support you and the rest of his friggin' family. You think you are above me, huh? He started standing up, throwing the newspaper across the floor. Maybe I could get some rest if my grown daughter would get a real job instead of painting in her room all day. Or burning a hole in my pockets going to school for something she already knows how to do. Alyssa could feel the tears building up as her father continued to admonish her. You're the reason luck left, you asshole. You always do this. The warmth of tears now flooded her face. Why couldn't it have been you instead of mom? What in the hell is going on in here? Her stepmother walked in, cradling a sweet potato pie in her arms. Alyssa and him locked eyes for a moment before he piped up. Nothing, just having a family talk. Dinner was awkward. Her youngest half-brother, Dan, speared a piece of ham and hummed to himself as he enjoyed his meal. At least he didn't seem affected by the tension hanging thick in the air. Alyssa lazily passed a pea back and forth across her plate and excused herself after a comment from her father. I wish I could be like a snowflake, drifting from the heavens above, like an angel. Winter was her favorite time of the year. Ever since she was a little girl, she reminisced when Papa and Mama would take her out and they'd make snowmen and angels together. As the years went by, her mom started having seizures and eventually couldn't even walk anymore. Papa worked so hard so they could buy medicine, but by the time she was 17, her mother had become completely bedridden and unable to do much of anything. She would scream at night in the hospital, saying something about a clown who wanted to eat her amongst other claims. It wasn't long before she passed, and the family fell on even harder times. You see, what they don't tell you is that funerals are expensive. The hospital bills were already crippling, but that last $10,000 that the life insurance refused to pay was their ticket to a living hell. Papa started drinking heavily and would beat up her younger brother Luck for small things like not washing the dishes or forgetting to take out the trash in the morning. On Luck's 17th birthday, he disappeared without a word to any of them. Miranda, her stepmom, entered the picture soon after, and it didn't take two and two to realize that her father had another family for some time. Dan was three at the time, and the resemblance was obvious. Miranda seemed to keep him in check, and that was enough for Alyssa despite the betrayal she felt in her own heart. The sound of her phone vibrating snapped her from her thoughts. The phone lit up the dark room, the name on the screen Brad. She slid the button to answer. Hello? Hey Liz, wanna go out tomorrow night? We're gonna prank Mr. Gooseby by painting his car. She let out a bit of a chuckle. Uh, that that does seem like fun, but wouldn't the paint freeze or the snow on the car be a problem? John says he has it figured out. No worries. Count me in then. Pick me up? Uh, sweet, yeah. I'll, I'll get you round eight. Peace out. With that, the line dropped. She laughed to herself a bit at the thought of pranking the art teacher. And for the first time in a long time, her eyes closed with a smile on her face. Her dreams were plagued with the thoughts of her mother. She was laying in the hospital bed, the cannula fogging beneath her nose and just staring at the ceiling.
She walked over. Uh, hey, Mom. How are you doing today? As she got closer, she realized the eyes held an expression of horror. A wet sensation overtook her shoulder as a sickening cracking sound was heard. Alyssa looked up to see tendrils of hair dancing across the ceiling, quickly overtaking it, a black ooze beginning to drip from many different places around the room. A sharp pain brought Alyssa's attention back to her mother, who is now erect on the bed, her nails biting deep into her shoulders. She tried to let out a scream, but a tendril of hair shot forward like a snake, wrapping around her throat and pooling taut. She desperately fought against her mother's hold, clawing at the tendril bounding her neck, fighting for one last breath of precious oxygen. Her arms felt so weak. She had lost, and it all grew gradually black. She grew slack, and her mother threw her arms around her fading soul. It was so cold. So very cold, she thought. Her eyes opened and she let out a scream, coughing and clutching her throat. The bed was soaked in sweat, and her father and stepmother burst through the door. What's going on in here? Miranda said with utmost concern. The father lowered his brake barrel. Jeez, Lissa, not this again. All she could manage was a pitiful whimper, her head hanging in shame as tears began flowing freely from her face. Miranda put on some coffee and the three of them sat at the dinner table. Her father had scrounged together the pieces of newspaper thrown earlier in his bout of anger. He was looking at its crinkled pages, glancing at Alyssa every other turn of the page. He set it down as Miranda walked in with three steaming mugs. Listen, I'm sorry for reacting that way. I know between your brother running away and Maya passing on, life has been difficult. I thought time would help, but it's clear that you, you need help with this. He paused a moment, taking a large gulp of coffee and let out a sigh. And I know I can't give that to you. He started raising the paper to his face. We're hiring you a shrink. The paper in his hands crinkled a bit as his hands closed hard around it, fighting back some kind of emotion. Alyssa just stared down at the table. Her mind was riddled with the thoughts of those tendrils and her mother. Dan, her youngest brother, walked in, looking around sleepily. Come on, big guy. We can see what Santa brought you after you rest up. Miranda put her arm around him and led him back upstairs. Alyssa looked up, her father on the same page for the last few minutes. She noticed a pile of envelopes on the table, most of them stamped with past due. The next few hours went by awkwardly. Miranda was on eggshells while her father was drifting in and out of sleep behind his newspaper. Dan came down once more, and all the men in the family room where a large tree sat decorated with the bits and baubles of the holiday season. The bottom of it held many boxes, name tapes, garnishing the names of each and every family member. Dan dived in, barely able to hold back his excitement. Oh, wow, he said, holding up a Buzz Lightyear action figure. He zoomed about the room with an expression of pure joy on his face. Dad was struggling for dear life to stay in the waking world while Miranda bent over and picked up a large box and handed it over to Alyssa. This one's for you, she said with a warm smile. Alyssa looked down at the red and white wrapping but couldn't muster the strength to open it. What's this? Her thoughts were broken by Miranda bending over to pick up a small envelope that was tucked behind a box for her father. It was a brilliant golden color with the emblem of two clowns dressed in suits, shoulder to shoulder with arms outstretched in either direction. Duos was imprinted below it. Might buy us some tickets to some show? Miranda had a bit of a smile and a half-quizzical stare as she opened the envelope. Removing the paper, she let out a small scream, throwing it to the ground in front of her. Alyssa's father practically shot off of the sofa onto the ground. What? What happened, Miranda? His face adopted the same horrified look as the three of them now stared at the sheet with letters L-U-K written in blood. Mike quickly reached out to grab the paper and a business card fell to the ground, while something else seemed to float underneath the sofa. He picked the card up and saw the same two clowns from before. Their suits now had a red and white color adorning them. Duos Carnival of Souls. Where the hell is that? He looked back at the sheet of paper. The other side was very concise. The words, help, written in the same blackish red. Fuck, fuck, fuck. He reached into his pocket and flipped open his phone. Alyssa stared at them a moment longer before setting down the bulky box and reaching under the couch. The sliver of paper was the same golden color of the envelope and said it meant one on the bottom. She wasn't sure why, but she placed it in her pockets as Miranda started crying.
Dan, visibly confused at the chaos, ran over and gave her a hug and consolation. The severe snowstorm compounded with a short roster made the arrival of the police a long one. When the doorbell rang, it took Miranda only a second to pull open the door. Officer Dablowski was a tall man, dark hair, gaunt features, and a handlebar mustache to tie off the trope. Dan was sent off to his room while the adults all gathered in the foyer, the letter in the envelope on top of the coffee table. Sorry you folks had to start your holiday like this. Can't say I've heard of this duos. He pulled up his radio and clicked over a few channels. Hey Martha, this is Officer Dablowski. You ever heard of a duos carnival? The room fell silent a moment. Alyssa felt sick just thinking about what could have happened to her brother Luck. Looks like there was a place called Duo's Family Entertainment out in Driggs, Idaho. I'll get in touch with the sheriff for that county. Alyssa felt a shiver run through her body as she remembered the one-horse town her father used to work in. There definitely wasn't any kind of fun to be had out there. It was so small, it was so small that even the post office had to close. The radio crackled back on. Looks like the place closed in the 30s. It was a branch with its parent company coming from, uh, Yugoslavia? Dablowski and her dad both scratched their heads and almost simultaneously said, Where on God's green earth is that? Dablowski pulled out a small plastic baggie and collected the letter. Y'all folks sit tight. We'll do our best sort this out. That's my son, her father began, his voice a bit visibly shaken. He's in trouble, and if I have to drive twelve hours and get out there, I will. Officer Dablowski put his hands in the air in protest. Listen, storm out there ain't a joke. We're both men here, so I won't be telling you how to live your life. We have officers in that area that can go investigate a lot faster than either of us can get there. The place supposedly closed damn near a century ago. Heaven forbid we can figure out who to talk to out in Eurojavia. Yugoslavia, Alyssa corrected. Same difference. Now... Let us do our job, Mike. Her father had a defeated look on his face, and Officer Dablowski left through the front door, forcing his way through the blistering winds back to his SUV. Alyssa went back to her room and sat staring out the window at the blinding snowfall. Duos, huh? There was no way her brother went there of his own volition. He hated clowns. She couldn't help but stifle a small, despairing chuckle. Her phone began to ring, and it was a familiar number. Brad... Hey, uh, just wanted to give you a heads up. We're probably not gonna go. This weather's something else. Wanna... She flipped the phone closed and it vibrated again, his number flashing across the screen. She ignored it, curled up under her blanket wishing the whole day away. The next few days felt like a haze. The police called without any leads. They supposedly found the place deep in some swampy wooded area. The attractions were in great disrepair and overgrown with local flora. The only thing they found breathing around there was a host of insects and a large bear that had been roosting in the Tunnel of Love. Her father had grown inconsolable, and by the time the weather had let up in a few days' time, he had driven off in his pickup truck with his pop gun. After a week, he had stopped returning calls and Miranda filed a missing persons report. Her usual composure had been all but decimated given all the recent events. Dan stopped talking to anyone and holed himself up inside of his room. School finally came back to session and Alyssa made her way to the door, a pop-tart hanging from her mouth. Miranda was sitting at the kitchen table, her face glued in her hands. The pop-tart fell from Alyssa's mouth as her jaw went slack and her body began to quiver. The table had another envelope on it. A jacket of a golden color. The police were there in 15 minutes and a forensic team followed quickly behind them. This time, the letter had Mike stamped across it and came with a severed finger a very familiar ring attached to it. The paper inside of the envelope had been soaked in blood to the point where most of the writing was illegible. The only thing each of them were able to make out was he forgot his ticket, written in the practice-looking font. Needless to say, she ended up missing class, but that was the last thing eating at her mind now that the worst could be feared for both her father and her brother. Luck was a pain in the ass, but she still loved him, and now Dad too? Her phone began vibrating. Pulling it up, she saw it was Brad. She flipped it open. I need your help. A day later, a beat-up Impala pulled up to the front of the house and honked twice. Alyssa grabbed the two bags she had hastily packed and went out through the door. I love you, Miranda. Take care of Dan, all right? She knew the proclamation probably fell on deaf ears, given Miranda hadn't left her room since the second incident. Stepping up to the car, she saw Brad, 
along with Chaz and Julie, two other students from her drawing from life class. Brad gave her a grim smile. I brought reinforcements. She couldn't help but feel grateful given the short notice and the very little socializing she ever did. Thanks, Brad. Chaz flashed a 9mm pistol. Let's go get these bastards. Brad stepped out to help her with her two bags. Brad was fairly short, with a dirty blonde bowl cut and a poorly trimmed beard. He stepped over and struggled to lift the heavy bag to the back of the car. They both hopped in and they were off to Driggs. After a few hours, Julie nagged about needing to stretch her legs and the rest of them agreed it was time for a breather. They stopped at some gas station in the middle of nowhere. Each of them quickly stepped out and began stretching. Alyssa laughed as she looked over to see Brad jumping trying to get his phone back from Chaz who made him look like a toddler. Chaz was a tall, athletic Afro-American with deep brown eyes and a mess of tattoos coming from every bit of exposed skin. Save his face. He gave Brad his phone, then lifted him up in a bear hug. Love you, buddy. Julie palmed her face, and the four of them enjoyed the moment of respite. Y'all buying any gasoline? A voice startled every one of them as they turned and saw a man wrinkled with age sagging in a rocking chair with a large cigarette ash extending from his mouth, clinging desperately over a pot of food. Brad piped up. Uh, no sir, we just wanted to stretch out a bit. The man let out a sigh and the cigarette fell into the pot. Well, least you could do is buy a bag of boiled peanuts. Me and Lisa would sure appreciate it. Chaz walked over and reached down and popped one into his mouth. I bet. He produced his wallet and handed him a crisp 20. Didn't see you before. You sitting there the whole time? The man laughed a bit. Sorry I broke the peace. Nobody wants to see my wrinkly hide out in this beautiful landscape. He gestured to the potato fields surrounding the place. Can't say I've seen you youngins round here before. Y'all from boys? Chaz let out a small chuckle. Out west, actually. Oregon whereabouts. I see. So what brings you out this way, family? Brad waved at him to keep quiet, but Alyssa spoke up. We're looking for a place called Duos. Heard of it? The old man gave a wry smile. Heard of it? Hell, I even worked there when I was a boy. You won't find much of anything but bugs and forest creatures out that way, I'm afraid. Abandoned, you see, after them kids went missing. K kids What kids? Julie said, biting on her fingernails. Well, can't say I remember it perfectly, but some of the kids who worked the coal mines decided they were going to take a little field trip. One of them supposedly found a golden envelope of all things, working a graveyard shift. Truth be told, I, I was one of them. Didn't believe the whole hoo-ha till uh, Lenowitz pulled out the thing, though. There was a note written in some kind of blood or something, promising $20,000 to whoever could beat the challenge. I was content enough with my 50 cents a week, but them boys had more ambition than me. Three of them went off, and, well, none of them came back. Yeah, I guess I rambled enough. Y'all uh, best head on back home. Ain't much else for you out here. The four of them made their way back to the Impala. The second the doors closed, Chaz let out a laugh. You believe this guy? He popped a bowl of peanut into his mouth. Bunch of them kids disappeared. Don't go. Ooh. Straight out of a damn Scooby-Doo cartoon. Julie let out a nervous laugh and went back to biting on her nails, and Brad looked paler than Nosferatu staring off into the distance. He hesitantly reached up and missed the ignition slot with the key, twice before slotting it and turning the engine. Don't be a bitch, B. Let's get on with this. Alyssa's bro and old man are missing. Brad hung his head a moment in shame of his weakness, and they drove off. Night came quickly, and Alyssa took over the wheel. Uh, check the map again, Brad. He reached into the glove compartment and started tracing their route. Uh, maybe another 20 minutes, and we'll be at a dirt road leading back into the forest. Brad looked back at the sleeping forms of Chaz and Julie. Probably should wait for daybreak at least, though. Her eyes felt pretty heavy as well. All right, that sounds good to me. Doubt we'd be able to see in this anyway. She stopped next to the supposed turnoff and killed the engine. Alyssa felt herself having trouble sleeping, especially given the cold. They throttled the engine a few times to get the car warmed up, but four bodies in a tight space quickly made for a suffocating atmosphere. Just as she felt herself drifting away, she felt a shift. The windows had too much condensation, and she tried starting the engine, but it wouldn't turn for some reason this time. Pushing on the door, she found it wouldn't budge. Wake up, guys. Something's wrong. Chaz was the first to respond. What the hell are you talking about, Liz? The others stirred and looked at her with sleep in their eyes still. Her frazzled state quickly snapped Brad to the world of the living. 
What? What's wrong? He didn't finish his sentence as she wiped the condensation from the glass and they realized the mud had risen over the hood. They were sinking. Shit, shit, shit. I haven't even paid off this POS, man. Brad was pulling desperately at the door. Chaz stood to the best of his ability and pulled back the visor of the sunroof. He began spooling the lever to open the glass. The cold quickly hit each of them. Chaz pulled himself through and then helped each of them out of their only ride home. Sitting on the side of the road, they watched as the earth finished swallowing the car. By the end of it, the front end had been completely submerged, causing the back half to hang about an extra foot off the ground. Oh, Christ, I need my bag, Julie said. Really, Julie? Chaz scoffed. Yes, asshole, my EpiPen and Quaaludes are in there. Reluctantly, Chaz and Brad made a rescue mission for everyone's belongings. The cold bit deep into Alyssa, and she shaked watching the two of them trek across the semi-frozen mud to the trunk. Anyone grab the key? Chaz asked. Brad looked back and then sighed as he was lifted off of the ground on top of the car. Just slide in and grab it, bro. Don't be a bitch. Y yeah, well, that's what your mom said. Chaz gave him a look that told him to shut his mouth, and reluctantly he slid down to the open sunroof back into the car. Falling through, he landed with a single foot on the windshield, producing a large spiderweb crack running through it. His legs ached as he slowly bent over to retrieve the key. The second he had it firmly in hand, the glass gave way, and mud slowly oozed into the vehicle. Ah! Uh, he pulled himself out and quickly jumped to safety. Quick, the key! Chaz said, his palm open. They glittered through the air, and Chaz went to work finagling the trunk open and tossing out what he could. The four of them sat shivering. Alyssa dug through one of the bags and produced a vintage magnum flashlight. Clicking on the beam illuminated a large part of the wooded area in front of them. Let me use that, Liss. I'll get us some firewood before we freeze to death. Chaz and Brad went off and started a pile of twigs and sticks they managed to pull from the snow. Matches were produced from the same bag, and Alyssa went to work trying to light the pile. I can't seem to get it. I think they're too wet. She felt an inappropriate joke coming on, but the seriousness of the situation seemed to tame childish minds. Uh, we could always huddle for warmth, Brad said with a glimmer of hope in his words. Not on your life, she replied. Chaz pulled out a flask, took a swig, then poured it over the kindling. The flame finally took and some of it began to burn. It quickly started to dwindle and they continued piling wood on top of it in a vain effort to keep their only source of warmth alive. Luckily, the sun came up after a long two or three hours. I'm on my last bar, Julie said, flipping her phone shut. Her nails, once preem, were now raw to the nub. Damn it, why can't I get a signal? I want to go home. Chaz put an arm around her. No turning back. Now we're here, and the only way is forward, all right? She quickly unscrewed her pill bottle and popped two into her mouth, washing it down with some booze. Jeez, Jules, lay off the quack, all right? She took in a large breath and looked back at him. I need this, all right? So back off. That's how they started their morning. Hungry, cold, and very much lost. Alyssa looked forward towards the entry of the forest. Now or never. Ice had formed on some parts of the road over the muddy areas and the progress was slow. A steep hill proved especially harrowing as each of them slipped on its incline many times before reaching the top. The prize was in sight. Cresting the hill, they could see the top of a large Ferris wheel-like structure over some trees. Its car visibly rusted even from this distance. It took another 20 minutes, but they finally arrived at a dilapidated wooden structure of the two clowns she had seen on the card, their arms forming a gateway to the park. Oh, cool, Chaz cool, running through the gate. The rest of them followed the first sight just beyond the gate, and it was a single overgrown booth. Branches jutted from the side of the structure, and shards of glass hung viciously from what was left of the window that adorned the front of it. Probably the admissions, Alyssa thought to herself. Now that she was here, she wasn't even really sure where to look. Me and Jules will check over this way. Y'all head that way, he said, pointing in the opposite direction. I've got the gun, so don't go messing around with anything out here unless you know it ain't out to kill you. Got it? Alyssa made a small nod, and Brad ran over by her. All right, let's meet up back in like two hours, okay? With that, they split up to start exploring the large grounds, mostly blending into the mess of leaves, plant life, and the snow that riddled the area. Hey, Brad, sorry about your wills. Thank you for helping me with this. Alyssa slung her shoulder bag on while Brad picked up the other. I'm glad to help, really. Anything to get out of Goosby's hair for a couple of days. 
The two of them laughed at the professor's expense walking further into the grounds. Every structure they came upon had clearly been a victim of Mother Nature, the rust turning familiar objects into very foreign ones obscuring their image. An attraction once meant for joy now sung songs of sorrow as they creaked and whistled empty as the wind danced through them. Look, the Tunnel of Love, Brad said, pointing to a hardly recognizable sign poised above a cave's mouth. Well, I guess it couldn't hurt to check in there, she said with a smile. Better watch out, though. The sheriff told me they found a bear in there. Brad's skin turned even whiter than it had before. Looking inside, it was clear that something or someone had been living there. A mattress had been thrown in the corner of the entrance and glass soda bottles littered the ground. Guess Paddington's a fan of cola. Alyssa began laughing to herself when a scream was heard from inside. Their hearts leapt from their chests and they ran as quickly as possible. Her foot managed to catch a root and she face-planted, losing herself to the trauma. She awoke with a police officer standing over her. It was starting to get dark and he pulled her to her feet. Don't know what you're doing out here, kid, but this ain't no place for young'uns. Her head was pounding, and the cold only seemed to amplify it. As her eyes adjusted, she realized she was in the carnival, its many forms no longer distorted by the roots and trees, but more by the darkness that surrounded them. I hope a young lady like yourself isn't one of them hoodlums from the usual mines. I don't know what you're talking about. Have you seen any of my friends? Her hand went to her aching head. Ah, so you aren't out here alone. No, oh, haven't found anyone else, but I'll have you know you're trespassing. He reached out and grabbed her by the arm. Come on, then. Let's get you back to the station. She pulled at him, but he had little trouble wrangling her a hundred yards or so to the small building housing four small cells. Truck won't be around till morning. We'll see who you belong to and get you on your way. He began walking over to a rotary phone embedded into the wall. Listen, my father and brother went missing here. I need to find them. He scratched his head and looked over. What are you going on about? Never mind. I read in the paper. They call it hysteria, right? Crazy women. He made a circling gesture at the temple of his head, then turned back to the phone. He began dialing a number and started speaking too quietly for her to hear. She pulled off her bag and started rummaging through it for her ace in the hole. Turn around now, Alyssa demanded. The officer turned to see a snub-nosed pistol aimed directly at him. I'm not going to ask nicely twice. I'm going to find my family and friends. His hand slowly started towards his side and a loud ring echoed through the room. God, you hysterical crazy! Shut it, Alyssa said, walking over and pulling a large set of keys from the wall. The officer was clutching his leg and swearing as she left out of the building. She began running towards the direction of the booth where they were supposed to meet. How can this be? What the hell is going on? The grounds were now well taken care of. The building looked as if it had been erected only months before, everything in great shape. No peeling paint, no rust. Stopping in front of the admission booth, her hands went to her knees to catch her breath. A small light went on in the booth, and she fell to her side as her bag unbalanced her. A man with an unsettlingly large nose sat behind the window, his face covered in boils and warts. Tickets, please. She continued looking at the creature, its dark eyes staring back at her. I said tickets, miss. I haven't all day. She stood and turned to make a run for the gateway where the two clowns welcomed her but found an impenetrable mist just beyond it. Hearing the creature shouting after her, she risked it and ran forward only to find herself turned around facing the booth again. Once again, she turned only to the same result. You can't leave once you've arrived, but you can't play without a ticket, I'm afraid. The thing waved her over. Hesitantly, she walked over. Do you want to know what happens to those who don't have a ticket, miss? He reached under the counter and produced a pistol with the Chaz scratched into the handle. She looked back up to see the large grin on his face. Alyssa felt her heart sink, thinking about what must have happened to her friend. She stepped back and raised her snub nose to the glass, pulling the trigger. Click! Click! What the hell? The hammer raised and fell with no fire. The thing raised its hand, its long, sharp nails ever apparent. A series of clinks could be heard as five rounds fell to the countertop. Nice try, miss. Now, if you'd kindly hand me the ticket in your bag, we can begin. She dropped the revolver to the ground and dug through her shoulder bag, producing the paper that slid under the couch the day the first letter had arrived. That's it. Now then, let's get you ready, shall we? He made a small clap and two women somersaulted next to her, seemingly out of nowhere. 
Each was dressed in colorful, flowy garb and grabbed her on either side of the arm and carried her off to a small tent nearby. They stripped her clothes off in a single fluid motion and started taking measurements. Get up! Before she could protest, a powder swab hit her face and she hacked at the assault. A moment later, an antiquated dress was brought in, and before she even knew it, it was around her bosom. The two women smiled at her and then held a hand mirror in front of her. She was horrified when she saw that her face had been painted up like some kind of clown. Black lipstick was smeared across her lips and the surrounding areas and bright eyeshadow certainly didn't complement the color. Her nose was a bright red with a few artistic flourishes. The creature walked through the door. Ready, my dear? And he grabbed her and pulled her along through the opening into another room. She couldn't believe any of this. She was in a standalone tent a second ago, and now she was standing in the middle of a very large-looking auditorium. A clown in a worn suit sat towards the edge of the balcony she had walked onto. She was ushered to a chair and quickly left to his mercy. Edward Duo, my fair lady. Welcome to my humble home. He raised both hands in a welcoming gesture. Alyssa looked down at the empty performance area and the impossibly dark seating around it. I'm not so sure I feel welcome, but I appreciate the courtesy. The clown stood up and made a bow. My humble apologies, Miss Sanchez. Surely you'll forgive an old clown. With that, he pulled a large daffodil from his sleeve and handed it to her. She wasn't sure why, but she found the whole thing charming and took it without a second thought. I'm very happy that you accepted my invitation. And extend condolences at the loss of your father. Alyssa's heart sank. W what do you mean? She said, disbelief tinging her voice. His hand gestured towards the performance area. A light snapped on and she could almost directly in front of her see what looked like a trapeze setup. There were three platforms, a figure standing on each. She immediately realized that the first platform had her father on it clinging to the middle column for dear life. Each was about 30 feet in the air, and the lip was barely enough to sit, with one's leg hanging off of the side. The other two figures wore white masks and skin-tight bodysuits, each patiently waited while looking in the direction of her father. Edward Duo stood. Welcome to Duo's, the greatest show on Earth! Cheers drowned his voice out. Quiet down, quiet down now. Our first act will feature the amazing Mike Sanchez! Boos could be heard from the audience. Now, now, Mr. Sanchez deserves his fair chance like everyone else, even if he didn't have a ticket. The boos and hisses intensified. Edward reached into his pocket and produced an ornate cigar box. Opening it, he pulled four fingers from it and tossed it below. Lend him a hand, would you? The audience began a rhythmic clap and the platform began to recede into the inside of the column. Dad! Melissa began screaming, but was drowned out by the audience. Mike desperately grabbed under the wooden bar with his one good hand and kept slipping off with the other as his face twisted in pain. A moment later, he dropped like a rock and was whipped off of the bar, only to be caught by the second performer who swung him high into the air where the third one managed to catch him. Her legs wrapped over the handlebar like a child playing on the school grounds. The whole time, Alyssa could just barely make out his screams as the audience laughed at the helpless ordeal. On the back half of the third performer let go and Mike went sprawling into the air once more, caught only by the ankle this time. They continued the swing until he was slammed into the center column producing a loud echo. His body slid helplessly the remaining 30 feet slack and the other two landed gracefully on the platforms and gave a bow. Excellent show, really! Edward was clapping wildly and had the audacity to look over at her. Alyssa could feel the warm tears flowing down her frozen face. God damn him. God damn this monster. She picked up a glass on the table and threw it over at Edward. He caught it, and without another word, two women showed up and strapped her to the chair. Now then, I think it's high time we go over the rules of our little game. Me and my brother have been so very bored as of late. We have concocted all sorts of fun attractions for you and your succulent little brother and luck. Survive. And the two of you are free to go with your heart's desire granted for each of you. Of course, no one has managed to do it yet. He began a cruel laugh, and Alyssa felt the rage boiling over at the mention of her family after the brutal murder of her father. The catch is, you'll find that the death will be on your hands, because you'll have to pick each other's challenges. And ordeals as you progress. For example... 
He produced a large red button from his coat and pressed down on it. The sand pit performance area began to rumble and opened, revealing a small pillar that raised from the ground. Luck, her brother, was tied to it. He looked around and began to scream something, but she couldn't quite make it out. Let him go, Edward. The clown looked over to her. I've already given you my answer. Now then. A large wheel was brought in with Julie strapped to its center. A dunk tank of sorts was revealed with Chaz sitting on top of it. And Brad was brought out and placed with his head sticking through a board lined up with balloons around it. Now, which game should he play? <laughs> now, dear readers, you get to choose the game Luck Plays. Option 1. Julie is strapped to a wheel of some kind, and a midget with a large hat has just set some knives in front of it. Option 2. A dunk tank has Chaz sitting on its pedestal. I wonder what's inside. Option 3. Brad has been forced into some kind of balloon board. I think they have some darts in front of it. Let's write a story. Let's play a game. Without the dice.